Okay. Um, hello, everybody. This is the chat between Vlad and Don. Uh, part two on the uh, F Sharp compiler. Vlad is relatively new to, not new to Microsoft, but works in the Prague offices of Microsoft uh, as part of the sort of .NET Core team in, in general. And uh, works on the F-sharp compiler and also uh, contributes to the Visual Studio uh, tools in Visual Studio code, um, <clears throat> the, the OmniSharp tools. And we've started this regular se se series to, uh, yeah, please feel free to use the chat that's there. I see hello from Sergi Tion down there. Hi, Sergi. Uh, Stavua, Eric, you just feel free to chat away amongst yourselves, comment on how little sense we're, we're all making, you can or say anything you like about anything. This is it. Uh, we, so this last week we used uh, a format where it was mostly me talking, honestly, last week. This week we've got everybody can potentially talk. So uh, we probably will try and have a few spots definitely where we take uh, take call, um comments by voice. You feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, leave questions posted there. Make sure we don't miss them. And I guess we can kick off. So today the the topic is the F sharp compiler optimizer. And uh, I'm not going to be fixing a bug. Last week I, I, I had We'd use the format where I went through and I fixed a bug in the compiler, and I think some people really appreciated that. And I would like, I kind of like to do that. But the optimizer doesn't have many known bugs. It's an area where a bug, uh, where it does the wrong thing and does a bad optimization, is of course extremely problematic, and something we tend to try to jump on very quickly. Uh, and whereas bugs where optimizations don't kick in. Actually, those are uh, probably there are some bugs. And if you're interested after this, uh, we can. I guess I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, we can look at some of those bugs. In fact, why don't I pull some of them up now? So let's go to .NET F sharp, sharp, and we can look for optimizer optimization. I guess. And we'll look for issues. And is um, is an example of an optimization. Ah, yes, the wonderful Sharp Lab link. Yes, I commented about this last time about how to submit bug reports to the F Sharp compiler, especially if it involves anything involving code gen. And uh, the wonderful link here for Sharp Lab. And here we have, oh, look at this. This is the sort of thing. This is actually a great starting point because it's the sort of reason why F Sharp has an optimizer at all. Now, there is a, you know, the C Sharp compiler doesn't have an optimizer, and the F Sharp compiler does. Uh, C Sharp, well, barely. C Sharp really relies on the .NET JIT as its optimizer for just about everything. Okay, the C sharp compiler does not inline methods and does very few reductions on the code that's coming through. The F sharp compiler does, and it's sorry, can you still hear me? Yep. Yeah, you can still hear me. Sorry, there's some some weird noise on the on the background. Uh, yes, so the F sharp compiler has an optimizer, and it's partly because you know at the very heart of F sharp programming. Uh, there's just an awful lot of tuples. There's awful lot of small discriminated unions. I mean, by discriminated unions, I often mean effectively discriminated unions being used as tuples, tagged tuples, effectively, like this. Uh, and there, are, and so, if in this kind, uh, in, in the kind of code where you know equals one comma two, people actually write this kind of code. In F sharp, uh, let's just get rid of this. Uh, like this. Also get rid of this at the top here. And oh, look at this! Look what this code has become in F sharp. It's actually returned three. Okay. Let's just put Y in there as well. 
It's return four. So what you can start to see is play around in Sharp Lab. And in fact, almost maybe we'll be coming back across here and we can actually do more live testing on the F Sharp Optimizer than we've ever done before. Because I've actually never sat down with Sharp Lab and just system we didn't have Sharp Lab when we wrote the F Sharp Optimizer. And just systematically go through the optimizer, look at some code and say, what is this meant to be doing? And actually double check that in Sharp Lab, it actually does that reduction uh, in for release mode over here. So what's going on here? What 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 are the kind of reductions that the F Sharp compiler needs, seems to know about? First, it knows about uh, assigning tuples to tuples. If expressions are tuples, it can sort of detuple them as they go along. Now the question is sort of, would this also apply if the user suddenly does this kind of transformation to the code and puts and starts using a discriminated union in there? And of course we go and modify this to be in. And we take a look, we ignore the massive generated code for the code for that lovely A class, and we get down to what we're really interested in, which is the fact that it's returning four. And one of the reasons why F -sharp has an optimizer is that we want this kind of consistency to the, we don't want it to be that when the user happens to use a tagged discriminated union here, and they suddenly write their code in a slightly different way, that uh, that optimization no longer kicks in. Uh, okay, we might be willing to, for instance, if they write a class, uh, because object-oriented code is a little bit less common in F sharp. So uh, x dot n and remember x dot m equals m and so on. Then maybe some optimizations won't kick in anymore. But if they just make simple transformations, we're particularly interested in tuples. We're interested in discriminated union, union single case, uh, and we're interested in records. Uh, that's a good starting point so, uh, for the bread and butter of F sharp programming. We are certainly interested in options uh, and the introduction and elimination. Now, that's a terminology I'm going to use a lot. Let's go, let's go back to int. In fact, let's, let's go back to tuples. Uh, that uh, we have the introduction of a tuple expression here and the elimination of a tuple expression here. And it shouldn't really matter. We want this to be, you know, it shouldn't really matter, for instance, if we use a match here and you go A comma B goes to A plus B. Like this, that should also still eliminate. So, uh, and sure enough, that that does. So the kind of uh, so we want that's it. So we do we want uh, uh, insensitive to different ways of writing the same thing? That's good. Now, but we're also there's uh, we're going to be interested in functions. So let's just see how we fare with that. But if we start with one three and we put it through a function where we go a comma b, which is actually kind of like a match, really, then it's also still going to go down to four. So it still knows about this uh, introduction and elimination of these tuple values. So, and it knows about piping. So that's important because this pipe thing if we switch, out, actually, if you look at the quotation for this, or if you, uh, which is completely unoptimized, no inline, no inlining, no nothing on that thing, then you'll actually see this pipe write symbol is still present as a function call. And this is actually a closure in the quotation uh, in, the, in the very least processed form of the typed abstract syntax tree. So it obviously needs to know how to get rid of this pipe, this piping thing. And so uh, we better be able to inline functions because what's the definition of the pipe operator in F sharp? Well, we could, you know, it is this equals F of uh, XF, XF equals F of X. That's, uh, and it, now it does actually have an inline attribution on it. Uh, the F sharp optimizer both knows about sort of must inline things like this. And but it also will uh, let's just double check. So let's, for instance, if we write our uh, so this is where we've got our own 
pipe operator. We've shadowed out the F sharp compiler pipe operator and we're using our own. We could use a different symbol if we want to be sure of that. Let's use some wacky, uh, yeah, some wacky symbol. Uh, don't do this in your own F sharp code, please. Um, and uh, it it is working, so it knows how to inline that. And what happens if we don't inline it? it still does. So it still knows about small function definitions. So there's must inline. Uh, so there's is the pipe operator, which we'll just we'll we'll subsume by saying inline functions, and we'll uh, must inline. Right? And this is actually semantically important. Uh, I'll skip that. It must inline and sort of small. Uh, inlineable, so small functions. Okay, and so we want some properties like insensitive to different ways of doing the same thing, uh, and uh, obviously the massively important one is correctness. Uh, don't in, uh, only apply optimization when valid. Cool. Okay, so we can we can inline things. Okay. <clears throat> right. Um, now, what are the assumptions of the F sharp optimizer? So let's write some of those. So so one is it is an uh, it is operates at the assembly level. Uh, no more than the assembly level. Level. So it's not a whole program optimizer. Okay. Uh, and it actually operates at, in practice, in truth, operates at the file level. Okay. Foo.fs. Okay. Uh, and in truth, it it, it 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 actually doesn't really do anything across the whole file. Do much across whole file. Uh, rather rewrites expressions independently. Fair enough. Rewrites well. It 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 does what you might think. It kind of starts here, optimizes this this thing here. Uh, Record some information about this and then sort of moves on to the next definition X and then uses that information down there. Uh, uh, so we'll say that sort of uh, top to bottom. Questions okay. and declarations. Okay, so, uh, so we want this to be. Hmm. I'd let say so we don't have a formal goal about this. We'd say no more than about ten to twenty percent of compile time, even for release code. Okay. Uh, debugging. Yeah. So ideally, produce good debugging code. Code, if feasible. Uh, and okay, so there's there are some other assumptions. Um, one is that the it so so some optimizations are local. Some optimizations are cross assembly. Okay, so now the, the F sharp compiler does do cross assembly compilation uh, optimization, and in the in the bad old days of software development, people had this endless desire to sort of update components independently. So you would actually make a bug fix to F sharp dot core, and not recompile everything above that. Now, fortunately for F sharp in many ways, that model has kind of gone away. Okay, because the F sharp compiler is sort of built such that it actually wants to, re if you if you make a change to a, a base component like F sharp core bug fix, well, you publish a new NuGet package for F sharp core, 
And that means everybody else re gets that new Nougat package and recompiles all their code against that new Nougat package. And that's how they pick up the bug fix and they bundle that thing with their uh, ultimate application or, or their consumers of their library ultimately do that. So that's actually very fortunate for fsharp.org because we put in this thing about doing cross-assembly optimization uh, and uh, it actually fits very well with today's compilation kind of assumptions. Um, so, uh, so now, so what does cross-assembly optimization mean? Uh, so that means uh, F-sharp assemblies can have an optimization metadata lop. Means that, okay, they are, so it's just, so now you're, you might already know that F-sharp assemblies uh, already have a, a, a signature blob, data blob. Uh, an extra one in addition to the .NET point of view. Uh, and that's because you always wanted the F sharp point of view on the world to potentially be richer than the uh, .NET metadata point of view. And we also didn't want to have to spend an awfully, an awful amount of effort to encode that in, in information into attributes and decode it back out. And uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's quite a tricky process, especially for type level information. And so F sharp assemblies do have a signature metadata blob and they also can have an, an optimization metadata blob. Uh, and okay, so uh, now whenever you have these metadata blobs, you have to be very, very careful because, and, uh, because you have to make sure you're not changing that format over time. Or if you do change the format, you continue to accept the old format and uh, things like that. So it's not, it's an it's a it's a, a decision you have to be you have to be very careful about, and it is uh, it can impact the kind of improvements we can make to the F sharp optimizer, and in, and also whether what extra uh, preventative coding you need to do around making those improvements, and also whether we can apply them to a core component like F sharp dot core or not. Uh, okay, uh, so there are some assumptions. Um, Right, so and we've got a playground where we can go and look at, at things. Uh, so we were looking at this bug here about what doesn't get optimi optimized by the F-sharp compiler. And it was something like this. It was by Nuno. Uh, and uh, it, oh, there was a Y here as well. And OK, so this is where each branch of an if statement is returning a tuple and you know you might think this is a comma b and and this is not being optimized and we can we can see this because you're actually getting that new tuple creation and it's new tuple and new tuple and so what might we want this to be well we'd kind of like this to be uh, a local mutable well let's call it local a local b uh, and this would become A gets this and B gets that, A gets this. This is in sort of machine, uh, F-sharp sort of pseudo .NET IL kind of mishmash, where this is the set local operation in .NET IL. And this would all be back like this. And then we would read out A and B. And uh, that would be the ideal. Now, um, if there's actually, you know, if someone here gets really inspired and wants to, you know, dive in and do something, it's not that hard to actually do this, and it would it would improve a lot of F sharp code. Um, this this sort of construct in F sharp is just immensely useful. People use this all the time, and I think it's underappreciated just how how much uh, how important these local blocks of logic which publish multiple results or encapsulate uh, a, a bit of work a, a bit of a bit of computation and then publish out the like the local parts to here this makes this is a really great way to 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 uh, to keep your the, the chunks of your f sharp logic kind of separated so people do use this in practice and they're using tuples not because there's no there's no use of a first class tuple value anywhere in this, 
And so that's kind of, uh, that would be the aim. If the people aren't using tuples in a first class way, that is we're not returning, you know, a first class way might be we were, where we're returning a parameter P here and, you know, actually returning that. And then we couldn't apply the optimization. We wouldn't do that uh, in that case. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world if that, uh, if in what I was writing before, you could make this go A dot P, get, get item one from that and, B gets get item two or something that would be okay, perhaps. Um, if but right, <clears throat> okay, okay. So um, before we kick in, I'm going to make a comment about developing the F sharp compiler. Let's me let me change where I'm working here. And that is last week. Uh, I think one thing I failed to mention is that we now have uh, a, a very lightweight way of developing and working in the F Sharp compiler, which is through the F Sharp compiler service uh, solution uh, in the in the compiler. There is a visual F Sharp solution that contains like everything, it contains all the Visual Studio tools. It contains the, the compiler dot private uh, and and I think you saw last week that it was a little bit sluggish to use that solution. Uh, we're trying to make it better, but it's not the quickest uh, way of developing the F sharp compiler. Um, whereas actually using the compiler services solution uh, is really quite fast. The IDE tools uh, work well with that if you're using Visual Studio, and I think the same will apply to Visual Studio code. Uh, so I guess we may as well use this. Uh, and one of the reasons is, is that it doesn't multi-target at all. It uh, it just, the F-sharp compiler service is a cut of the F-sharp compiler code, which only targets .NET Standard 2.0. Now, Normally, we wouldn't uh, think of adding compiler language kind of optimization correctness tests to this test solution. But to be honest, I, I, I personally think we can, we'd have to discuss with Will and Vlad and Philip and Kevin and others, uh, but I would actually be okay with people. If, P, if it helps you to develop on the F Sharp compiler, and you want to put your testing in here because you're using this solution, I think that's okay. I mean, it's cool. We run these tests and you, you know, it's the easiest way to get going with the compiler. By all means, you know, we've got to make your job easy. Part of that, part of our job is to make your job easy as contributors. And so um, go and add some, if you add an optimization test here, it's just fine. In fact, the, the, by using the F sharp compiler service tests, there are it's not it's not a bad test suite to use. It's 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 pretty pretty. You can make things pretty slick there. Okay, so let's um, let's just try and get cut across to the code. I love, why don't we take a round of questions? Uh, and yes, so great. Philip has linked across to something I was uh, going to mention, which is uh, here, code optimizations here. So in the compiler guide, there is a list of the, uh, the optimizations performed by optimizer.fs. So let's just run through which ones I've actually, uh, well, we'll refer back to this list as we go along. Uh, okay. Um, let's take some more questions. Vlad, uh, you can interrupt my flow. Yes, you can interrupt now, certainly. Yeah, um, like <clears throat> we have one question so far, which is from, from Matthew, and he's asking like, at which point does the inline keyword take effect? And uh, is it like earlier yes. compiler pipeline or like do we use it to, you know, like replace the expressions yep. or something? Yeah, that's great. So let me go up to the uh, compiler diagram here. And we are talking about this optimization code generation abstract IL rewriting. So the inline keyword has two effects. It has an effect on type checking, which is sort of here, this area. OK. 
Can you actually see my cursor or not? Oh, yeah. it's very, it's yes. up, up, updates very slowly. Yeah, yeah. I okay, so yeah. So, um, so the inline keyword is primarily a semantic thing for F sharp. Uh, so that's why it e exists. And so let's go back to that gist here. And that is because if you do um, in as many of you will know if you have some math that does x plus x here and uh you look at the type of f f is now working on integers okay by default this plus defaults to integers but if you make it in line sorry x plus x then this becomes generic math code and f i mean we're looking at the compiled code here we haven't got hover tips uh but f becomes a generic function here and uh you have to actually inline you, you must inline this in f sharp because this needs this addition is acts like a template and this addition needs to be resolved by one of these static uh member constraints so so the type checker needs to know about inline and it needs to know that it can generalize the code, make the code generic, uh, and that you'll, if you look through the long type checker, you'll find some places where this refers to inlining because of that. But it doesn't actually inline the code. It just applies the semantics of type checking with regard to inlining, allowing it to do that generalization and inserts the constraints associated with that. And but so the, who does the inlining? Well, the optimizer does the inlining, which actually means that the optimizer is actually run in debug code. So when you uh, the, so if you're compiling debug code, it does go through the optimizer, and it will, for example, if there are, if there are inlines coming from F sharp core, then it will pick those up and apply those. If they're coming from your own code, it, it must apply those semantically and and and, and transitively, and it will continue on. Now, um, of course, there are loads of optimize. It doesn't actually do any other optimizations. All it does is expand that inline code and a little bit of code flattening, I think, and, and nothing else. And it's, that's very important not to do that or else you really screw with the debuggability of your code. Uh, because yeah, the more optimizations you do, the, hard, the harder it is to maintain good debuggability uh, of, of the code. Okay, so the optimizer is run. Now, when I'm referring to the optimizer, I'm actually referring to optimizer.fs here. You, you will notice there are a few other things to get done here. Um, now, the, the one, these two, I'm not gonna really talk about very much because they are things that the F-sharp compiler does and we put them in early and they're stable and they work and they they do some good to code, but I don't have any plans to develop those further or you know take that code, you know where they they're just frozen as far as I'm concerned. Uh, then there's nothing, it, yeah. There's, there's it's not that there's anything wrong with them, but just we've had a, a sort of lag a lagging kind of subtle interactions with other kind of language features or corner case things and they're they're, they're in good shape and uh, I will perhaps try and mention what they actually do I mean their names uh, kind of uh, convey what they what they do um, but um, you know it might be that they're not necessary they're not run they're only run in release code and it might be that we could eventually rip those out and replace them by some much more general approach to optimization. Uh, they, they also do look across the whole file more than um, the other more than this optimizer.fs does. These other there are two other ones here. One is a what is effectively a semantic translation. I'll just go back to the gist to explain this one. Now, as you all know, you can use mutable locals in F sharp. Okay, and uh, you can let's just you can do x plus x. Okay, and you can do this goes x goes x plus one. Okay, so, on. so these are the equivalent of vars in C sharp. 
And uh, sure enough, you get the corresponding kind of code, um, plus plus, etc. Uh, however, um, the question is whether you can capture those mutable locals in functions. So, for example, can I have a local function which uh, which increments that? Uh, and can I return that function as a first class value? Maybe we return copies of two copies of that function. And you'll notice here that when we this mutable local has to now because you you can mutate those from inside functions. Not that I particularly recommend that way of writing things, but this thing now has to be captured in a. a in a, in a in a closure object and not just in the closure of f because you could have two functions that co cooperate to hack on that x and return those two and you just want to promote that thing once so that they are using so it's going to become a heap allocated object and so the transformation we do to make sure that this works semantically is to put these on the heap and effectively put that as a ref over there and this effectively gets changed to x dot value gets x dot or contents about it's the primitive but you know, x dot value plus one and then this one gets the same thing and that is the same code that is so that transformation to take mutable locals which get captured uh is uh what this auto box transformation is in the compiler and you can take you can see you know, decide escapes, check whether things actually escape. It's actually a very, very simple transformation. We can probably read through some of this. Uh, it, uh, okay, from a read through from the bottom in typical F sharp way, we're transforming an implementation. We decide some things about the, so an implementation file means we're transforming the representation of foo.fs after it's been type checked, a type check, a type checked implementation file. OK, and we, we, we make some decisions about escapes. Uh, we actually do emit warnings. It's a, a warning which is turned off by default. But if you really want to go through and turn it on, you can find out the warning number. Do a search of the F-sharp compiler for it. Uh, and there we go, number 3180. You can turn that on and it'll tell you when you're implicitly uh, um, uh, promoting things onto the heap, mutables onto the heap. Uh, not that it's, it, you'll want to know that. Uh, you won't, you won't want to know. It's because it's almost certainly what you want to happen. Uh, and uh, we then rewrite the file. Oh, no, we make a set of a mapping between those values and the corresponding expressions, which will be the reference cell ones. This, uh, this reference cell expressions uh, or with the types associated with those or the locals there. And we go and rewrite the file with regard to that. And uh, we the intercepts we use is if there's an assignment, we go and modify it. If there's a use of that mutable value, it becomes a ref cell get. This becomes a ref cell set. And if you're taking an address of that mutable, we becomes getting the address of the contents field of that reference cell. So that's the actual rewrite that we do. And that is actually more or less it, apart from this bits where we actually go and work out um, work out escapes up here, which you can look at separately. OK, so that was all to aid uh, in explaining what that uh, uh, auto box transformation is. There's a separate thing which we can do as a separate topic and we'll come up when we talk about uh, tasks and async state machines and so on, which I know a lot of people have been asking about as a future uh, topic to discuss. And that is the business of getting rid of uh, sequence expressions. And that's this, uh, that's this state machine compilation for sequence expressions. Uh, we can talk about that in a separate uh, separate compiler session. Um, OK, which really just leaves us with optimizer, which is one we're going to go through. OK, let's have a look at the signature of the optimizer. Any more questions at the moment? Aha, OK, if we're writing a transpiler, can we grab the ASD pre-optimization? 
yeah, now this, the, in fact, you can because the F sharp compiler service comes with this wonderful. Uh, if we look at this one, so part of the F sharp compiler source code services is the ability to get the F sharp assembly contents after type checking. And this is what Fable is built on. So Fable is uh, uses the F sharp compiler service. It goes through and let's see where's the entry point. Let's just take a look here. Yeah, let's take a look in service. And I've just got to remember where we so this one. Where do we actually get the contents of the assembly? Oh, it might be an F sharp checker results. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so when you when you run through the compiler service and you um, you get the results of compilation, uh, then one of the things you get back is this wonderful check file results. You can also get F sharp. That's the results of checking an F sharp file. It's all in the name, just back to front. Uh, there's also the results of checking an F sharp project. Which is F sharp check project results. And you'll see, look at those two F sharp assembly contents, which Stephen is exactly what you are after. The view of the contents before optimization has checked in, uh, has kicked in. But actually, what people have been asking for is the view of the contents after optimization has been applied because uh, that can be extremely useful for things like Fable. Uh, I'm not actually sure the status of Fable, whether it's using the first one or the second one, uh, but both are available. Uh, and um, in terms of the assembly contents, there's uh, a view of the expressions and declarations. Here's the expressions in the compiler, F sharp expressions. And uh, then you get a whole lot of active patterns to go and look at those expressions from the compiler service. And uh, it's all very familiar, I think, to people who are doing F sharp code. This is the view of the uh, of what the contents of an uh, implementation file are from the outside of the compiler service. It's a correspondence to that other thing we were looking at in that auto box. It corresponds to this. Um, This impl file here, typed implementation file. That's the so everything in the compiler has these sort of the internal compiler data structures and then the external view through the compiler service. Okay, because we we need to protect ourselves a little bit. I mean, we don't guarantee binary compatibility for the F# -sharp compiler service API, but we do want we don't want to break everybody's code all the time. So uh, we do want. Uh, so these are the external view, and basically it's a whole lot of type declarations or module declarations, which we always call an entity. It's also a whole lot of member or functions or values, and there are the expressions there. These are the arguments here. Uh, this is the value being declared, if it, and this is the expression, and, or it might be just an initialization action, some side effecting action in the top of your script. Okay. So that's the view from the outside. Uh, and yes, so that question is you can get the both pre-optimized and post-optimized contents. Aha, Fable 3 has an option. Thanks, Aid. Uh, great to have you along. Uh, Fable 3 has an option optimized to whether or not use the optimized AST. That's cool. Okay, so what about parentheses, uh, which then become extra function calls as far as I can tell? Uh, that's So there's a question about, yeah, why is something not equivalent? Now, uh, in general, parentheses disappear early in F sharp. So the um, the vast majority of parentheses do go early. So we let's we covered some of this in the last session, but uh, if you look at the syntax tree, and if you look at syntactic expressions here, and we do see the parentheses there. Okay, it's the very first node. Okay, but if you look at the typed tree and you look at here, and if you look at uh, expression here, there aren't 
many nodes in this typed tree. It is a dramatically reduced structure compared to the syntax tree. And we haven't taken a good close look at this, and in a way, uh, we we probably should now just to spend a while taking a look at this. Now there are no parentheses here, so in theory, parentheses should be irrelevant for everything underneath. But that said, uh, Thomas has given us a case where they appear to be relevant, uh, and um, now. If I recall rightly, there may actually be a bug in this. Uh, and let's just check on the results coming out. I'm just going to make these into functions. It can be a bit easier to see what's going on. It can also be a bit easier if you give them long names so they stand out from everything else. And we get rid of this baby here. And let's look. Okay, and it is actually true that they are not being treated as equivalent. Now there, there is, uh, the, there, yeah. So this is a question: is where is where are parentheses sort of semantically significant? Okay, so when you have a function application in F sharp, f x y, the order of evaluation. Remember, this f could be a uh, a site. This could be an exp an arbitrary expression. Okay, it could be. Something like printf n hello, then return the identity function. And this one could be the same thing. It could be this uh, printf hello world, return the value two, and then this printf hello, hello world again, three. Okay. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Yes, yeah, so you can't actually apply all to all three. So let's say we'll return, we'll make this into some function. X, Y goes to X plus Y. Okay. So it's important to consider what's the order of side effects here. Like what do, does, yeah, there's several options that it could do. It could evaluate the function. That's obviously got to be done first. And then evaluate the argument and then apply the first and evaluate the next argument and then apply that. But that's actually not what happens. Uh, uh, there's a bug here, I will curse myself, but it's always possible. Uh, but what it will do is it if you have f, x, y, it evaluates f, then x, then y, and then, and then applies both arguments, okay? And it's important uh, that it does that because we then get to use this invoke fast too on, on functions. So what's actually going on here is if you read this more as a sort of get item call, uh, it's actually like an array get or something, array get on the array at zero uh, here versus array get uh, zero, Two like this, and you'll see that it's going. They are different because when you put the parentheses in, it says actually I really want to do this. I really want to do that partial application, and then I'll do the other argument. Okay, so parentheses are significant in evaluation order for function application. I guess is the answer to that question. Semantically significant, and the and the type checker and all optimizations have to um, not muck with that, and that is why they come out as different. So um, I think that answers the question. That's a very, very good question, Thomas. I do think there's one bug in the compiler, in the listed somewhere. I do recall one, uh, someone, yes, this is the bug issue. Uh, and it may be that it's sort of not a bug, but is intentional because of that semantic, uh, um, semantic mistake. And Cool. Actually, Philip, that reminds me. Philip has called out a thank you to Thomas for making a compiler contribution. Maybe in these sessions we could uh, spend five minutes at the start. Maybe Philip or um, Will or Vlad would like to to volunteer just to um, to run through the contributions we've had from the community and to to call them out and say thank you for those. If Philip, if you want to link to that one, that would be great. Or any others you want to send along, please feel free to do that. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, okay, so the question, and are we up to date with the questions there, Vlad? 
think I've I've covered them. Yeah, I think I think we covered. Uh, you covered everything. Cool. Good. Okay. Great. Right. So now we can get to let. <coughs> so let let let's spend a while looking at the typed abstract syntax tree of the F# -sharp compiler. Uh, so this is what expressions become. And it's got, fifth, I think, 13 nodes in the tree, 14, 15 or something. OK, so we'll run through them. So an expression can be a constant. And let's just look at what, that, what range of sins that covers. It covers uh, all the way through to even decimals are there. Uh, and and uh, sort of the, the, the null value for some type. OK, and all the, all the usual suspects of constants. Let's go back. Uh, everything has a range and also carries what constant, what's the type of the constant being uh, represented. So that if you um, do 1.0, let f equal 1.0, that will be a constant expression, expression.constant node in the type abstract syntax tree. Right, so we also have values uses of values so you've got a reference to some value you can go look up what a val ref is it's also got some flags about is it a special use of us one of these special values and of course uh those values flags are uh, well, guess what object-oriented programming and all its joys are we uh, is it the, this value associated with calling the super init of a constructor okay or is it the self init now we're not going to be talking about OO stuff, so let's just absolutely ignore all of these. This just gets it's always going to be a normal val use as far as we're concerned. Okay, oops. Right. That's a val. So that will let's just write out the corresponding thing. If you have f of x equal x, that will count as a val use. It will also cover a lot of other cases, such as if the x came from up here. That will also in the F sharp TAST type abstract syntax tree type tree world. Uh, that will also be the use of a value. If it's a value coming from F sharp dot core, it will also be the use of a value. So if we just had like equals the identity function, equals the sign function, those are all just uses of F sharp values. Uh, get rid of this up here. Uh, okay. Um, it will also cover the use of another function, uh, the G part, the use of G is uh, the value ref. It will also cover the use of F sharp members. And so if we use the constructor, will be an F sharp val. We, 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 we put objects into a form where where it, everything's a val, the constructor is a val. If we take C as an argument here, we do C dot P, the use of the property, the get P method, use of the method is a val. Okay, so that's quite a lot of things come in through that val node, not the, not the application of that, that was always the first class use of that, those things. So we also have sequential expressions, simple enough. A, uh, what, uh, sorry, um, print f hello, uh, then return one. Uh, those are just expression one and expression two with some debug point information. Uh, and okay, then lambda values. We're gonna see more of this later. Every lambda value is given a unique identifier. Uh, it is potentially associated with object-oriented programming, which is those. Uh, it is takes a set of values as arguments. It has an expression body, and that's it. Type lambda expression. So this is when things are generic. So if you have f of x equals x, for example, this becomes a generic function. And the F-sharp co compiler put, so to, to be more explicit about that, you can do this. Like this. The F-sharp compiler puts this in a form, uh, which is sort of, 
we use a capital a lamb to mean an abstraction over types, a function which takes a type argument. And then we use a lowercase lamb uh, normally to represent taking a expression argument. And then we get you know, returning some body. Okay, so you might see this notation in comments in the compiler. This is the type abstraction. This is the uh, this is the lamb the, the term abstraction, the expression abstraction. Now, to be honest, this is what this isn't the greatest choice in the F# -sharp compiler because in practice these are never really usable as first class values from the F# -sharp compiler, from the F# -sharp language. That is, we always actually know where the type abstractions are. They're always on functions, for example, or on methods. And we should really have not had this node and instead moved all these type lambdas to the declaration points of those generic things. We didn't do that, and it is in the expression tree. And in fact, I do believe that one of these optimization phases, this inner lambdas to top level functions, can actually generate new lambda, tie lambda values. So there is some, you could say we have an overly general um, intermediate representation in the F sharp compiler, and it it might sound good to be general, but it can lead to problems, especially when generating good debugging code or, or just people not understanding what's going on. So it's one reason why I'm calling that out. OK, so this is an application node. So this is uh, where you have a function. So every time I write, uh, uh, if I take f here, f of x equals x, um, and then I apply that let y equal f to four, then this f will be an application node. So that will have a function. It will have a, a list of arguments. Uh, and it will also apply type parameters. So when you look at a generic function, so if this was uh, x comma y, and y is actually generic here and unused, and you apply it to for and uh, string. OK, then uh, this this type application node will include the type argument, the inferred type argument. I, uh, I, I will write it here. I'll make everything explicit like this. And so it will include the function value, function expression, the type application and the arguments here. OK. Yeah, now this type, uh, these arguments are actually a curried application. So these ex multiple expressions represent the first expression will be a tuple, but if it also took a Z argument here, then the next expression would be um, such like, so these would all be in the one application node. And that again is important because for that evaluation order uh, that you evaluate the function, then all the arguments, then do the function application. The let rec and let, I'll just cover let. Uh, so let expressions are put into a form where they're kind of nice and simple. So if we have f and we do let to v equal one in v plus v, then this will come through as a let, no, let node. That's, uh, now, if the let had pattern matching, then it will have disappeared by this time. So pattern matching has, has gone by now. So if it, if it was like we were looking before, then this it, we, is not present. This has been eliminated in the tree to some other form. And, uh, and it's much more like this. Uh, so let's run through that. We have a binding, which is a value to an expression. Then we have a body, and that's it. And we do compute every now and then you have to go through and compute free variables over these things and we kind of make sure we don't do it twice and we do that at this let expression nodes. I'll skip over object expressions. Uh, this is what matches look like. This is important for optimization. You have some input. Uh, no, you have some decision being made and you have a set of possible targets for the match. And uh, sometimes you have to optimize these. Uh, and then you also have these static optimizations which come from fsharp.core and from nowhere else. 
and it's a set of possible alternatives for the uh, expression, a set of possible conditions. And other, this is the actual expression. I have to remember what that alternative expression is. I, to, I can't, can't remember. Uh, and good, you have quotations, which I'll skip over. They're irrelevant for optimization. And these witness arguments are also irrelevant. They're to do with quotations. Uh, this is a residue of type checking that we can ignore. And this is actually just used during type type checking uh, to in, uh, so we can ignore that as well. OK, so from the point of view of optimization, ah, I missed one op covers a lot of different things. So an op is something where we have a set of argument type arguments, a set of arguments, and we're going to do something. In some ways, it sounds like an application that we had before. So like an application of a compiler intrinsic. And it's something where we, in terms of evaluation, Op doesn't have any computational content. There's no evaluation that needs to be done. Uh, so it's a different app in that way. Uh, and, but the arguments get evaluated left to right uh, before the operation is performed, and then the operation is performed. So if you look at op, this includes a whole bunch of primitives, such as a, a node to create a union case, create a sum value, create a none value, create a list a console, and so on. Uh, and you can run through these to, to make a tuple value, to make an anonymous record, and you can run through and look at all the different ones. There are some things that do mutation, it's not purely functional. So uh, to get the field of a tuple to uh, set, let's take a look at some of the set ones. Uh, oh, we can look at one down here, We to make a call to an IL method. So this is anything in the .NET universe becomes an IL call node. And if somebody wants to make a pull, a really simple pull request after this, please go through and look at some of the use cases of IL call. Uh, let's put on whole word. Choose one like this and go through and take these names here, use call vert is protected value, new option, so on, and put them in as labels on these things. I'll just show you. I'm not going to do this because it's a nice first thing for somebody, somebody to do. So put on put on the actual naming and go through and do that for this entire T op structure to give good names to every field because the, the, the reason isn't that it is good documentation, but above oh, actually the names are up there if you want to propagate them through. Uh, but the great thing is that they look a lot nicer in the debugger because if you don't name them, you're going to get item one, item two, item three, and it's really, really hard to know what's what. So if you just go through and put those names in as metadata onto the union type th thing, then the, the debug is going to look a lot better. So please um, go through and do that. We did do that on the syntax tree. So if you look uh, here, syntax tree, you see we've got we've named everything, and we've laid, laid, we've. It doesn't have to be on one line. You can put them across multiple lines like this. And uh, that'll be a, a, a significant improvement to the F-sharp compiler. So please go through and do that. Uh, OK. So any, maybe we'll get a volunteer on chat saying, I will, uh, uh, you can, I, I volunteer to go and do that. That would be lovely if someone did. OK, so we've been through these, and we saw that there's about 10 nodes which are uh, relevant to optimizing uh, expressions. Uh, it's pretty tight, you know, it sounds kind of simple and it's not, it, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it, okay, let's take questions. All right. Uh, okay, uh, where are we at? We I think, hey, these are pull requests from the community. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and someone is saying we could do an introduction to FSLex and FSYAC. Yes, we could have. Will, thanks. It's good to have you along. Uh, OK, Soren asks, why do we keep them as tuples and why not use anonymous records? Like, yeah, and I do get there's kind of this thing like some of those forms that we saw were very similar to each other. Single case discriminated unions are very similar to tuples, anonymous records. There's a historical thing there that, that 
we didn't have anonymous records uh, 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 when we first wrote this whole thing. And uh, Ryan is going to take us a, uh, a swing at doing the, uh, yeah, okay, thank you very much, Ryan. That'd be great. Put a thumbs up to that. Um, and how much of an impact it would be. The, the thing is, it wouldn't gain us anything. And it wouldn't gain us anything because this, we ultimately have to serialize these data structures out into that optimization info that gets attached to F sharp assemblies. And that, uh, so that, uh, so it's also in the inline data. So uh, it, that the way we check that we don't break that optimization info or the or the inline data or or anything is by keeping the code identical from version to version for that. So we can uh, visually assess. We can also run some actual tests on it, but it's important that we be able to visually assess that we're not mucking with those serialization formats. And the way we have cases in those for tuples. Uh, so let me show this. So if we look at uh, pickle, what's it called? Uh, typed tree pickle. The word pickle is a, is a cultural word for um, serialization in the functional programming universe. I don't know if anyone else uses it. I guess it's like to pickle something in a jar, put it in a jar and make it last longer than it should. Python does. Yeah, does it. All right, good. Thank you very much. Uh, so this is the way we pickle these things out. And we uh, have some expression cases here. This is, this is curiously written, I must say, this file. Here we go. This is where we pickle that type, those nodes we were just looking at. And you'll notice that we also pickle op nodes. So we have a pop there. Okay, just waiting for my screen to update. Okay, we have a pop, and you'll notice that those tuple uh, ops uh, get introduced. And, and so when we added struct tuples, we actually, um, did have to extend this data structure. We had to make sure that we continued to. So we did. We didn't add a new struct tuple case. We just reused the existing one, and uh, we we had to make sure we allocated a new kind of thing for uh, for a new number for pickling um, struct tuples. And okay, so you can see why we don't change this much you know we could merge a couple of these things do the hard work to do that but then we'd only have to undo it anyway and then the process of making that kind of change we can make mistakes and it doesn't really add to so much clarity really uh this is, is a is, there's another lesson i've learned over the, the f sharp compiler over time i touched on it last week which is that this kind of making more and more cases the same in the in these intermediate languages has the has the side effect that you you have to undo that for the purposes of inverting back to debugging or inverting back uh, uh, back to quotations and thing and 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 pickled outputs like this. So it's not necessarily a gain to do that. And I've touched on that with that uh, as lambda uh, typed uh, lambda abstractions as well. It's not necessarily a good thing that we did that made it more general. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's talk about opt optimization. Probably. Okay. Let's take a look at the signature for the optimizer. Okay, so that's the optimizer is here. This is the entry point. Optimize an, uh, an implementation file. We've seen this before, a typed input file. That's the contents of one file in our overall project. It takes what you'd a bunch of things you would expect. Uh, uh, some settings about what to do. Yeah, these settings should they should probably go into the settings. There's no reason for them to be separate. Uh, and right, and then what does it produce? It produces an it takes an incremental optimization environment and produces one. 
So stuff that's used in, uh, so this, well, this is going to can probably contain all the information about inline stuff from previous files. It's also probably going to contain all the information about what we have to inline from other assemblies. Okay, so this is a big fat structure, which is our environment, our universe. We produce a new one of those, and we produce a new typed input file, so it's a rewriter. We also produce some optimization info to go and uh, to, to go and put away, and we also produce this signature hiding info, which we can talk about a bit. And uh, we also return a function, uh, which in case we need to run the optimizer again, there's a few a few bits where we decide to run it late in the day uh, on on those state machine fragments that we generate and a few other cases. So very small expressions that we we um, put that as press. I did something. Ah, execute. No, I don't. Well, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, so that's our optimizer. Okay, let's just reset that nonsense. Uh, okay, that is the thing. Hmm. Where do we start now? Let's let's have a look at how we build this up from the outside. First of all, we get a new one back, which will contain the file added to the optimization environment. But we also bind a CCU. A CCU means an assembly. Uh, it's got a compilation unit. It's old terminology in the F# -sharp compiler. Uh, so it's to bind an assembly. And CCU thunk means a thunk, uh, a reference to an assembly. And this is the optimization information we we read from the assembly, and we take the incremental optimization environment, and we bind it in, and we get a new one. So we should expect to see this bind CCU get called in the optimize inputs thing, which is add external CCU to optimization environment. And for example, that gets called in here, which is get initial optimization environment, which gets called from the F sharp compiler. Here, optimization environment. So this is right at the very top of the compiler, fsc.fs. In phase two of the compiler, we've done a few other things, encoding the information that we uh, bind, get that initial optimization environment from this TC imports, which is the table of all the assemblies that we've referenced. Right, so we're getting the initial optimization environment. We're, we're starting off empty, we're folding across and adding the uh, external CCUs. And uh, each of those are uh, calling bind CCU. And that is here. Now let's take a look inside the optimizer. We looked at its signature and we'll start to look inside and look at its data structures. So this N here is this incremental optimization environment. And sure enough, we just add it to the table, uh, which is just a functional map uh, here of uh, strings to lazy module infos. I don't really think they're actually lazy in practice. I think that was a, that's a residue of an effort to make them lazy. You can talk about that separately. Okay, so what's in an incremental optimization environment? There's the global module infos. Module should really be CCU, probably. Don't think we should really be using module in that sense. There, that should that's really a um, in yeah it, it, yeah module or namespace is what it goes to really. It's, uh, okay, global module. So that's those ones. Uh, now let's choose one of the, these. We have uh, local external values. What's that about? This is, I th think. Actually, I, I won't. I won't. I won't really follow that one. It's not so interesting. I think. Uh, right, just trying to orient myself around this code again. It's been a while. Right. 
right. Just, just, just getting my orientation for you. Okay, so we the place to start when you're looking inside the optimizer is in the what we know about expressions as we're doing the optimization. The optimization is just a walk over the expression tree. Okay, so if we track down to the bottom here, and we're talking optimize an implementation file, it is this optimize uh, implementation file internal, which ultimately runs through the module definitions, it runs through the bindings, and runs through each individual module definition and then actually optimizes um, the contents of the module here and then uh, optimizes a binding and so this is where we do let you know let x equal one plus one or something like this and then this is the expression here and the key thing will be to uh, it might be a function so we call optimize lambdas and this is sort of the entry point where we're optimizing a potentially a lambda expression. Check if it is a lambda expression and we go through and do it. And if it's not, then ultimately we get to optimize expression. And this is where everything kind of boils down to. OK, uh, so if we look at what optimizing an expression does, takes an expression returns an expression and returns a summary of information about that expression. Okay, now this is crucial. What do we know about and what information do we learn about an expression? Okay, so if we look at that, optimize that expression value info here, then these are the cases we might know that it's a value. I, I know nothing about it. It's very common. We might know uh, the might have an estimate of the size of the value. Plus, we recursively know something else about it. So this says we know something. Oh, and we know something more. This is similar. It says we know that the value is equal to another value, along with some additional information. So let's take a look at that over here. That means F sharp knows that. If you do this like this, but you have an argument X coming in, then at this point, F sharp knows that V equals X and can replace uses of V by uses of X. In fact, you can see that's exactly what's happening over on the right to that V, and then that enables V to disappear. Okay, you have to be very careful. You don't, you, you know, if it's mutable, that may not be what you want. It, it, it's okay if it's mutable and hasn't been changed, then things uh, are okay. We still know the value of V at these usage points down here. Okay, so that's that node. Uh, we might know that something is a tuple, and we've seen some examples of that before, and it just lists out the expression value infos for those. We might know that something is a record value. And so this is a sort of case where we have this is this will be the record type, and this will be the set of things we know about that record type, about the record. And it's very important that at this point in the structure, the things are in the normal form where the fields are in their definition order. And order of field definition does matter in 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 um, in F sharp uh, for records, and so that you can assume that's what this comment is saying: the fields are in definition order. Similarly, for making a union case, here's a reference, and here are the arguments. And you might know that something is a constant. We saw those constants before. And then uh, you might uh, know that to, this is another case where it's a constant, but the constant is, is actually this expression. And finally, you might know that the thing is a function. Okay. 
will be where we know that that that, that will be in a case, for instance, where we know that in line uh, g of x is x plus one, then we know that g is a particular function value, that g is bound to find x goes to x plus one. line off because that's not so re that's irrelevant okay so the declaration that g x equals plus one g this will give rise to an optimization environment where g which contains this kind of binding for g curried lambda value here and it's just really the contents of that lambdas that we saw before the unique and then the, again, please someone go through, or we've labeled up here, go through and put those in. Arity, size, the lambda expression, and then the overall type uh, the, of the, of, of the uh, that's associated with either the function or the, or the return of the lambda, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, right, so I talked before about uh, elimination and uh, about introduction and elimination. So where do we learn these things and where do we use these things? It's also important to know to notice what the F# -sharp compiler optimizer doesn't know. Okay, it doesn't know anything about other kinds of things that aren't in this list. Uh, so it doesn't know that uh, v is an object, for example. Uh, so if you just create some object type c, it doesn't remember that. It, just, it doesn't even, it's got the type of v, but it doesn't remember anything more uh, than, than that. And we don't, so this is actually an area where there's a lot of optimize, a lot of easy additions to optimization, I think, is to actually make it more aware of simple functional objects. Uh, so uh, you could think about that. Um, that would mean adding new cases to this structure to track more information about objects effectively. Okay. So let's knock off some easy cases. Let's uh, to, to look at. We'll just pick a couple. Let let let's look at where it uh, where we get some constants. Okay. So we print those things. We estimate the size. We so let's let's look where we learn that something is a constant. So here's a place. Make boolean value. It's uh, actually so that wasn't what I was looking for. Let's go through again. Let's just go look. That's where we use it. Let's skip these tables here. I was looking for the place where we introduce these babies. Interesting. Okay, they they don't get introduced in quite the way I thought. They only get reduced by. So maybe this is the one we're looking for. Here is where we introduce constants effectively. So where we learn that something is a is a constant, and you can again you can see that if uh, if something is a small constant expression, mm. Mm. I just gotta look carefully here. Let's try this again. Optimize constant. make value info for constant that looks better ah there it is i missed it through right that's where we introduce them so sure enough if we if we hit a constant node in that tree that we saw in the type type syntax tree then it becomes a constant node and we learn that the thing is a constant and this info is a make value info for that constant okay so that's the introduction point and that actually follows our int int intuition that if we have 
let uh, f of x equal 1, then this is a constant node, and it knows, or let v equal 1, let y u equal 2, v plus u, then this is, is a, introducing these constant nodes here. Okay, so where do we eliminate them? How do we get to 3? How do we do 1 plus 1 in the F-sharp optimizer? Well, there's got to be an elimination, uh, a critical elimination point for this. And uh, you can see here that what we're, the, the optimizer is actually does one plus one by actually running or interpreting IL instructions. And that is because when you take plus and you inline it and you're using integers, then the F-sharp core rem remembers that this is a uh, nose tells you this is going to be compiled down to the IL add instruction. And so the optimizer then sees that and sees it's being applied to one and two. And it uh, has one and two coming in here. It runs through the integer binary opcode, passing in all these plus 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 functions, which are all instantiated to different types. This is the plus for S byte. This is the plus for int 16. This is the plus for int. This is the plus, okay. So it's got all the implementations of plus. And if they're both in 32, it'll go through and actually call that function and make an in 32 val, which is going to be three. One plus two equals three. Okay, so that is the Effectively, the f -sharp compiler is a sort of partial evaluator for a combination of those typed abstract syntax trees. So the f optimizer is a, is a partial evaluator for the combination of the typed abstract syntax tree and these uh, IL instructions and this extra information about values, about what values actually are. Okay. So, of course, you'll notice there's a loop here. We're using the F-sharp compiler's implementation of plus at, uh, to optimize that code. And so we can, but we can trust that. We know that the F-sharp compiler is doing, doing that plus correctly. Okay. Um, let's have a look. Just to say we, we don't do that for floating point. You'll notice we're only doing this for integer binary operations. We don't we don't simulate floating point operations in the F sharp compiler. We just leave that up to the to the whatever floating point implementation, and that's you know for obvious reasons about precision and everything else. We just don't want to get involved in that game. And we do that for a whole lot of other primitives uh, uh, that you can all. Go through and see and check shift rights and everything else. Okay, so that is a fair chunk of what the F-sharp compiler does. So I didn't go through and yet explain how we inline things. So that if we look back, we've dealt with constant values. I think you can see how they get optimized around. Uh, and we could now start to choose other ones of these. So you can do that as an exercise, go through and identify where union cases are produced and eliminate it. <coughs> so we'll just take questions now, and I know time has been drifting on. And Stephen's asking, is there anything I'd unwind towards uh, simplicity? I'm not really, um, uh, that's a much more general question, Stephen. It's a it's a it's a good one, but let's just focus on the on what we have. Uh, and cool. Any any other questions there? I think we've we've got them covered, haven't we? Cool. Right. Um, Quick question. Yep. Matthew here. I was wondering Hi, if there were any high yield optimizations that if you had time you would work on? I know you've mentioned yeah. several as we've gone through, but there, yeah. are there any others that have been identified? 
Yes, there has. There's one, and there's one that is. Uh, there's quite a lot of notes about it, and that is to do with um, how we lay down code for uh, for Boolean conditions like this. So if we have some expression here, this one and expression two and expression three for instance three and then there's, there's some e e other structures some ors as well four then dot 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 uh the the il we generate for these is not great it's not so much that this would fit with the optimization there's there's a question of how we actually generate code as well in the in the ilx gen later on we don't do a good enough job on these kind of conditional structures. We can absolutely do better. Uh, and that is there's long notes about that in one of the F sharp compiler issues. And I think it's probably the most important performance thing in overall uh, for sort of super high performance code. Yeah, Does that makes sense. Yes, thank you. I'm going to go find that now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not an easy issue to solve because um, these things have all become effectively, they've all become matches. Uh, so this has become sort of match expression one with true or false, then going to various, uh, going to some target and then, and then this actually becomes quite a lot of matches it's not exponential or anything but it does become this and event eventually you get down to the sort of the else branch uh, the then branch and the else branch the targets for those uh and there'll be other sort of dummy targets put in here like this sort of. uh, and the aim is to kind of get rid of uh that okay to generate, I mean, in this case, it's an example of just, we want to generate what C sharp generates for the corresponding code, because that's what the .NET JIT is going to do the best job on. Uh, and yes, we have to, well, we don't end up doing that when we go down this path. We end up too many jumps and uh, too many false Boolean values being produced. Uh, all right, okay. All right, there are notes about that. Right. So let's talk about one of these other cases in the F sharp optimizer. Uh, we just take a um, little. Okay, now I should just finish up by talking about a different topic. Okay, I'll leave you to, to to go through and take a look at where the lambda values get introduced and where they get eliminated. And the way you should do that is by looking at these identifiers and searching for their introduction and elimination points. Uh, what I want to talk about is. So where, when we collect up this optimization information, we um, so we produce these incremental optimization environments, and we produce this impl file optimization info here. Now it's very important that we don't leak uh, leak too many details as we as we go across assembly boundaries. Okay, so there's a separate process that happens to trim down that uh, optimization information and get rid of stuff that is private, okay? And uh, that is really an important thing, okay, for the for the correctness of the f -sharp compiler. So if you, for instance, had let private uh, f uh, equal uh, printf and secret or something, it's not a security boundary, but you know what I mean, this is private. And then you do G and you call F like this. And let's say you inline G. So actually, and it's going to be part of the optimization information, even in debug mode, because it's, you know, we, we track those always. Then uh, then this is bad because then there's another assembly here. This is, let's say that's an assembly boundary and it calls G. Well, it's going to get inline to a call to F. And this F is private and then you've got invalid.NET IL and uh, you, it will really fail always. So uh, so we can't do that. So as we collect up the optimization information for G, uh, we are for the whole assembly, we have to uh, 
of the implementation file, we have to apply the signature to it. In effect, the private sort of implies a signature where things are hidden. So the signature hiding information will say, go away and hide F. And then sure enough, you know, there will be an error associated with that use of F and you'll, you'll get error reports saying, actually this optimized, you know, this thing uses stuff that is private and you're not allowed to inline this. Okay. So just to say that uh, that process is a significant, um, it, it, it's actually quite a tight implementation of, of how that signature hiding is applied. Um, I think it's just at the end of the optimizer that that gets applied. If, uh, uh, if I've got it right, yes, so that's here. We compute the hiding information at the assembly boundary, what gets hidden, and then we abstract, meaning hide, or we, hide in, uh, we hide the optimization information. And this process of, of doing this abstraction, hide information because of a signature or because of privacy declarations. Uh, this is, we get all the hidden, work out everything that's hidden, and then we run over the optimization information. And if it's hidden, uh, we will give an error message somewhere along the way here. Okay. And there's another thing here, abstract optimization info down to essentials, which says own, get rid of everything except what is must inline, uh, the inline um, declarations. Uh, and that is actually an opt uh, that actually corresponds to a compiler option, I think very rarely used on the F sharp compiler, which is throw away the optimization, as much optimization information as you can. Uh, as I said, the way people compile .NET code these days and always recompiling when things get updated, we don't need to worry about those scenarios so much anymore. But just to mention that phase. Uh, okay, so I think, given that we've gone on for an hour and a half, it's probably a good time to wrap up for the evening. Uh, I think we've covered the basics of, of how things work and taken a tour through the code. And even more importantly, perhaps we've covered that typed assembly tree data structure, which is at the core of so much of the later phases of the F-sharp compiler. And, um, okay, oh yeah, Matthew's had the uh, issue assigned to him already to go and fix that optimization problem. That'd be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, uh, fantastic to have you all on the call. Anybody want to chime in, say anything, say hi to anyone, social call for the rest of the time, or any questions you want to ask, uh, please ask away. Uh, one thing that I want to um, bring up for... Hello, hello, Hello. Yes. We should, uh, we should... Yeah, it's morning over there, isn't it? Uh, I, sh I, sh I should make this a UK time. Uh, we, 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 should, actually, we, we should have a point where we break out into a beer or something like this and the usual pub is at the being, pubs being closed over here at the moment. Uh, it's actually uh, afternoon here, so it's totally, totally okay. fun. Yes. Um, but so I mentioned this in chat, but uh, one thing that we're going to do is uh, in the next F Sharp Software Foundation board meeting, we're going to um, bring up the question of uh, if the F Sharp Software Foundation can have a YouTube account, and in that YouTube account, can they host these videos that are being recorded? Um, everybody wants to do it, but it's it's like there's like a legal matter that we have to take care of um, by formally putting it to a vote and having that vote recorded. Uh, but once that's in place, we can have this on YouTube, and so then um, people can refer back to this afterwards, and we'll also probably linked in the tutorial itself. Got it. All right, that sounds great. Okay, I'll just flick through some of the contributions to the F Sharp compiler. Uh, use target framework name to determine the kind of framework. Okay, uh, thank you, Theo, Theodore. Uh, and let's look at some of the others. Prove error reporting, missing equal on type declaration. This is fantastic. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, that is going to help a lot of people because I I know that case and it's T-op try catch to try with 
This is actually really cool. Uh, it's, it's a, I think it's a renaming, isn't it? Yes. So the compile this is from the last com compiler community session. And um, Jeff, hi. I don't know if you're on the call. Uh, if you are, thank you very, very much for doing that. Um, that renaming. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, a new version option from PTJ Daily. If you're on the call again, thank you. Uh, I actually don't know what this is about, but great. I see compiler, compiler version banner. Yes, that's good. Uh, is that oh, the one we did? 102? No, of refactor FSC's task pool toolpath logic. This is in the F F MS build support. It's great. Thank you, Theo. Theodore. Uh, remove du duplicate documentation. Dugnad cleanup timer. What? Fantastic. Nothing better than, than removing stuff, especially dodgy old documentation. Uh, and uh, fix building with root parts that contain space, spaces. Okay, that sounds sounds um, sounds great. Yes, yeah. This is a perennial problem with this kind of repo. Uh, that if 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 you have working in repos that contain spaces in their paths and so on, that's so good to get that cleaned up. I think every CI build system in the world should have run the build twice, one with spaces in the paths and one without. Uh, make sure that always works. So thanks for that. OK. Um, cool. Anybody else want to dive in? I can't see the names of, I've only got nine people here on my screen, including myself, and uh, I can't see the names of everybody who's here. So. If I could dive in, if that's all right, just Stephen here. Stephen, sure. Um, okay. right. And I've got to run. I've got to do a school run in a second. But um, it's, mo it's mo morning, morning in Australia. It is indeed. Um, yeah. <laughs> so quotations. Um, I've messed around with quotations in the past. I've pretty much decided to run with the compiler services. Yeah. Quotations were a little bit quirky, if I might say. Um, the expression trees were. Um, I'm not, the shapes were not consistent and quite hard to work with. Um, is there any way we could mop that up? So in general, we keep the quotation form the same because people start to, to start to mm. depend on them. When you're working with quotations, you have to work with them in similar ways to the optimizer works. You, for instance, there's some, there's some dummy variables get inserted into them for, to do as various F sharp compiler structures get uh, introduced. And so you have to do that. The kind of thing where you track that that some dummy is equal to some other expression, and you can kind of eliminate it as you go down. So, so you kind of have to clean up the quotation as you as you're going as part of your processing of it. Uh, yeah. And uh, people who work with quotations, I've seen generally kind of learn the things that they have to do eventually. Uh, and, and 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 do that. That said, for for many many purposes, the F# -sharp compiler service is a better way of doing metaprogramming uh, for than quotations. You know, quotations have plenty of uses, just like expression trees in, in C# -sharp They're very and, convenient, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're they're runtime integrated but. and, and they, <laughs> they give you the entire the entire yeah. entire structure. But for many purposes of metaprogramming, it is better to do the F# -sharp compiler service approach. So, for example, we've had a long history in the F# -sharp universe of people prototyping things, and in fact, getting inspired to do things with quotations, and then eventually writing a full thing backed by F# -sharp compiler service. I'll give some examples of that. Fable started off, I think, even Web Sharper possibly started off as a quotation-based thing. I might be wrong about that uh, for Web Sharper, but certainly Fable started off as something called FunScript, uh, which um, used quotations to convert to JavaScript. And that's all very well. Work mm -hmm. FunScript was good, but 
in the end, they want to accept all of the F sharp language and write very large programs, not just very small fragments. Yeah, so Eric uh, Sapalis, hi Eric, uh, says Web Sharper did use quotations a long way back. Uh, and and both, I believe both of those now just work on the F sharp compiler service data structures. Uh, bye, Stelwa. Thanks for coming. Uh, and um, uh, so there are, there are, there are actually, and it's actually when I met Alfonso and told him that the expression trees were now available in the compiler service. And I think I said to him, hey, you could just write a, a you don't need to have the F sharp compiler around in your loop. You can just write a, 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 a F sharp to JavaScript tool that takes the F sharp syntax and goes down to JavaScript. You can get rid of the, yeah, and then he realized he, he, he delivered that and through Fable along with the community. And um, yeah, there's actually about another five or six examples of that. Uh, just, so one extra question yeah. on that sort of vein. So is there any work going on with regards to MLIR? So the um, LLVM uh, effort to target TPUs and other interesting. So I don't know. So I, I, I mean, uh, yeah, it. Um, I don't know of any work in the F sharp world to put it to MLIR through that route. Um, the. Um, I, I, I coincidentally, I, a lot of my work at Microsoft is on AI and machine learning programming models. I'm working a lot on Diff Sharp at the moment, and you're all welcome mm -hmm. to come along and follow the work in the Diff Sharp repository. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, and coincidentally, we are using the F Sharp compiler service uh, as part of the tooling in that to do shape checking on tensor programming. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a, a pull request that's in there at the moment. So that was another example. I initially prototyped that with quotations. And then said, "No, no, I need to use a full compiler service to do this uh, analysis." And um, now we could take those tensor programs and go down to MLIR. In general, MLIR tends to be a little bit lower in the compilation stack than something like Diff Sharp. These AI programming models have very deep compilation stacks. You've got the source language. And then inside, but inside something like Torch, there's multiple levels of actual kind of compilation that happens in PyTorch uh, that happen either when they're preparing the kernels or when they're when they're when they're doing those uh, later. Uh, so when they're doing those dynamically, and there's all the shader languages and everything else that goes down to the GPU. And so, um, I, I I do you you could do a straight up F sharp to MLIR translation. But the question is, what, what would your, why would you do it? What would your programming model be for actually, what's your, what is your input? Okay, what, what do you, what library of stuff are you programming against? Would people, you know, there used to be a day when people would think of, uh, say, taking array programs in F sharp and getting them to run really fast through some Fortran or backend or from some C++ or through MLIR or something. And that, but but people don't do that kind of work anymore. Instead, they just program up te against a tensor API. Okay, that's where all the work is done these days is you program a tensor program. And so I guess my response to that would be don't use MLIR, but use it. Don't, well, if you're going to use MLIR, start with a programming model of tensors like Diff Sharp or something like that, and then take it from there and, put, um, and work down. And yes, you might use the compiler service to do that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Uh, okay, this was Boolean combination. Uh, so this uh, in the chat, there's the links towards getting better, yeah, better code for this kind of uh, kind of work. Uh, Unfortunately, it did get closed off because, yes, okay, you can follow through. Thanks for the link there, bud. Okay. Okay, I think we're done for time. Uh, people are dropping off. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming along. And um, uh, we will see you all at the next session and see you all in the repo in between. 
Uh, look forward to lots of good contributions. Okay. Thanks, Don. Cool. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Thanks, folks. Yeah, thanks, Thank Mike. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, John. Good to see you a lot. Take care.